Welcome. Uh, welcome to you all to uh, the Dean Speaker Series, uh, named for the Dean, uh, which is a uh, fora in which we bring in truly distinguished, successful alumni um, from the law school who have uh, taken their law degrees and made a huge difference in the world around them, but maybe not in ways that they expected when they graduated uh, from the law school. I, you know, I come into contact all the time with graduates of the University of Pennsylvania Law School who are doing amazing things, whether it's in government, in business, in international affairs, uh, taking the legal education and the, the analytic capabilities that uh, legal education provides for you and really just uh, redoing the world. Uh, and that, quite frankly, is an apt and perfect description uh, of today's speaker uh, in every way. He is the empresario, the person who was put together, um, clearly one of the greatest memorials uh, in the history of the United States. And you'll hear today a lot about what was required to put all the different pieces of this together. Um, as those of you in this room know, it's been 12 years since 9-11. Uh, and I think nobody uh, who, who was aware at that time, alive at that time, will ever forget the events of that day. A terrorist attack killed more than 3,000 people, uh, blew a hole in the identity, the culture of the United States, um, as well as our economy, for, in, from which in many respects we're still recovering. Um, and aside from the economic consequences, clearly it also impacted the uh, structure of our government, uh, and set forth a whole series of new legal challenges that we read about uh, today and have been the focus of a number of different conferences here at Penn Law School. Our speaker, Joe Daniels, carries an astute awareness of that day. Many of us watched the events from afar. I was down uh, on Sansom Street. Joe was there firsthand. At the time, a consultant for McKinsey and Company he had taken a train to visit a client in a building across the street from the World Trade Center, uh, and, but when he saw, when he got off that train was stunning. He walked up uh, the street and uh, what, it, the vision I think remains with him uh, clearly for the rest of his life. There was a raging fire and gaping hole in the North Tower and he stood horrified as he watched people jump from the windows and plunge to their deaths to escape the inferno. Soon after that, he saw another plane rip into the South Tower and later witnessed the building collapse. Uh, that day, of course, rocked the nation, but it also changed Joe Daniel's life. When the opportunity arose, he would commit to rebuilding and commemorating the site as president and CEO of the National September 11th Memorial and Museum. Today, Joe will talk about the obstacles and bureaucratic nightmares he encountered the stakeholders he had to satisfy and the regulations he had to overcome to make the 9-11 memorial a reality. It was like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, you may have seen him on 60 Minutes talking about a lot of these different issues, but he is the person who put it all together and from everyone you talk to, he truly has been an, a conductor, an impresario in making this happen. He was prepared for these challenges as anyone could be, uh, he brought to the job a sunny optimism and a set of skills that suited the complex project. Uh, the most important skill, of course, was that he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Law School in 1998 and went on to become an associate at Crevasse, Swain & Moore in New York. Uh, he later became a consultant at McKinsey, and that's where he was working when the attacks occurred, and before too long he decided to make a dramatic career change by entering the nonprofit world. Went to work for the Robin Hood Foundation where he led a $45 million public-private partnership to build libraries um, at underperforming schools in New York. But that job whetted his appetite for civic engagement. So when he learned in 2005 that this new organization would been created that he could help, he signed on as counsel and within a year he became himself the leader of the National September 11th Memorial Museum. It's a big job. He directs planning, construction, development, and operation. That puts him in contact with an alphabet soup of government agencies as well as private organizations, contractors, architects, neighborhood residents, businesses, and 9-11 families. And that's been the easy part. 
bringing to grade a 16-acre, 70-foot-deep hole in the ground and working around trains that run under the site presented engineering dilemmas that you wouldn't wish on anyone. Of course, Joe had to perform another feat for which I have some very great admiration. He had to raise uh, more than $450 million to make this a reality. Uh, now that is an achievement. I can only imagine the pride and relief that Joe felt when the 9-11 memorial opened on the 10th anniversary of the tax with a moving ceremony marked by a moment of silence. Joe's office overlooks the memorial and what he sees when he looks down from his office several stories down is, is simply magnificent. Two reflecting pools in the exact footprints of the Twin Towers, the highest man-made waterfalls in the United States where each tower stands, and bronze panels around the pools etched with the names of the victims of 9-11. Now Joe has turned his attention to the 9-11 Museum, which he spoke at um, about in on 60 Minutes, which will be just as impression, impressive with its collection of photographs, testimonies, and personal belongings to educate the public and preserve the memory of that day. I recently learned that Joe shares a birthday with George W. Bush and the Dalai Lama, two, ra two rather different personalities. It turns out that Joe needed the determination of George Bush and the saintliness of the Dalai Lama to lead this project. And lead it he did, and has had an amazing uh, effect, but not only on the city of New York, but the United States and the world as well. It's been his life's work, and it is a life well spent. And for those reasons, he, we at the University of Pennsylvania are so proud of him and everything he's done. And I'm truly honored to introduce you to the man behind the 9-11 Memorial, Joe Daniels. I want to get a, a copy of that for my eulogy. That was so nice. <laughs> Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, as Dean Fitz said, I'm Joe Daniels, President and CEO of the National 9-11 Memorial Museum. I first want to thank Penn Law and Dean Fitz for inviting me here to this very, very special speaker series. And I just have to say that being back here at the law school is such an honor. To see the way it's grown since I've been here is just tremendous. I was fortunate enough to have amazing, an amazing experience here, not just from an academic perspective with professors like Leo Levin, Stephen Morse, Clyde Summers, Sally Gordon, um, who had such an impact on my, my career part of my life, but also because it was such a tremendous environment that I made some very uh, lifelong friends here, so it's an incredible place. Rebuilding the World Trade Center has been a tremendously complex endeavor, and the need to balance all of the sometimes competing perspectives on what this site should be make it even more so. First and foremost, we decided that the priority was to commemorate the nearly 3,000 innocent people who lost their lives on 9-11. We envisioned that the memorial itself would be the emotional heart of a rebuilt World Trade Center and the catalyst for the entire Trade Center's rebirth. For the first few years that the memorial has been open, visitors have had the unique opportunity to witness the rebuilding taking place around them, including, of course, the Freedom Tower, which is behind me, or One World Trade Center, which is the tallest building in the country, except if you followed recently, there's an Ann Randian sounding Council on Tall Buildings, which is about to rule whether or not the spire on top of the building is a spire, and if it is, then it qualifies the 1,776 foot height. If it's an antenna, then it doesn't, and the Sears Tower remains the tallest. I just gave Rahm Emanuel a tour a few days ago, so obviously he's lobbying for the antenna <laughs> side of it. <laughs> um, September 11th, 2001, of course, was a day of terror but it was also a day when the bonds of humanity strengthened in unimaginable ways. We came together back then, and those bonds that were reinforced are the positive legacy of 9-11. Bonds between coworkers and friends who faced unthinkable circumstances on what should have been a regular Tuesday morning. Bonds between strangers who may have never met before, but risked their lives for one another all the same. Bonds between what? and who was lost, and between those of us left behind. 
The memorial, of course, as the dean said, opened on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, September 11th, 2011. And while at times it did look like an overwhelming challenge to meet that date, the goal was born out of a simple and fundamental recognition that, like it or not, the eyes of the world would be focused on that site on that day to an unprecedented degree. We simply had to deliver a memorial that would inspire and that this country could be proud of. Since then, the memorial has welcomed more than 10 and a half million people over these last two years from all 50 states and more than 175 different countries. The visitors have included heads of state of some of the most important allies of the United States, such as Prime Minister, David, Prime Minister of England of the UK, David Cameron, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, French President Francois Hollande. Recently, we had the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The Queen of England was actually there, which was really nice to meet her. Um, one of the most important visits, though, um, I remember taking is with the Taoiseach of Ireland, which in Gaelic, Taoiseach is the Prime Minister of Ireland, Edna Kenny. Um, and we took, went to the top of the Freedom Tower, the very, very top, not only top of the building, but we walked up the spire, and it was on St. Patrick's Day. And it's uh, pretty special to be with the Irish Prime Minister on St. Patrick's Day um, at the World Trade Center, since there is such a deep connection between um, the Irish community and the first responder community in New York. The memorial has become, in some sense, the physical symbol of the feeling of coming together after 9-11 as embodied by this photo of President Obama and the First Lady and President Bush um, and the former First Lady who came on the 10th anniversary to pay their respects. Perhaps though even more meaningful than all the dignitary visits have been the visits of the thousands of men and women who have served in the military as their response to 9-11. One of these visits was with Sar Sergeant Dakota Meyer, the youngest living Medal of Honor recipient who fought his way into an ambush in Afghanistan, rescuing three dozen American and Afghan troops and recovering the, rema the remains of four fallen American servicemen. These photos show some other military visits to the memorial, including countless re-enlistment and commissioning ceremonies that have taken place there. In building the memorial, perhaps one of the most emotionally significant challenges was the arrangement of the 2,983 names of those who were lost. The arrangement, I believe, makes this perhaps the most unique memorial that has been or ever will be built. Originally, a proposal existed for a completely random arrangement of names that would, in a way, reflect the horrific nature of the attack themselves. But a recognition emerged that a higher aspiration would be to infuse this arrangement with a deeper level of meaning. In honoring the nearly 3,000 people killed, we acknowledge that they were the everyday mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, and sons and daughters who made up the fabric of this country and who did on that day what we all do every day, simply get up in the morning and go to work. More than 400 of them were first responders, died performing their sworn duties, rushing into rather than out of harm's way. The victims hailed from 93 nations, the oldest was 85, and the youngest, two and a half. And so like the individual lives they represent, the names on this memorial are connected to each other. They are arranged by layers of meaning, reflecting where people were or who they were with on 9-11, and more than 1,200 requests made by next of kin for individual names to be next to one another often based on who their loved ones knew or loved. I wanted to take a few minutes to share with you how these relationships were honored through, through the arrangement itself. This image is from our memorial guide. Like many aspects of the memorial itself, our objective was to take something complex, in this case, the layers of meaningful information in the names arrangement and portray it as simply as possible. This is the landing page of the guide showing the memorial looking north. Most broadly, the names are organized into nine groups, one for the February 26, 1993 bombing, two for the Twin Towers, four for the hijacked flights, one for the Pentagon, and one for the first responders. Within these groupings, the names of individuals from each company or agency, or for example, the passengers aboard a flight, appear together. 
Here, by searching for Cantor Fitzgerald, you can see the names of the 658 Cantor employees, everyone in the company's offices that morning, and where they are ins inscribed around the North Memorial Pool. The most personal and meaningful aspect of the names arrangement is its ability to reflect the relationships that existed between those killed. And some of the most heartbreaking stories are those of entire families aboard the hijacked flights. Daniel Brandhorst and Ronald Gamboa had changed their travel plans so that they could return home from vacation with their three-year-old son, David, on United's Flight 175. Daniel and Ronald's names appear alongside one another and above their son's name, something that would not have been possible through a more standard alphabetical arrangement. Within seconds of Flight 11's crash into the North Tower, the FDNY and NYPD dispatched units to the World Trade Center. Among the first responders who died heroically on that day were brothers, John and Joseph Vigiano, who had both in different ways devoted their lives to serving others. John was a firefighter with FDNY's Ladder 132, and Joseph, a detective in NYPD Squad 2. In order for their names to be together, the entire FDNY section ends with John's unit and the NYPD section begins with Joseph's. The first responders arrangement began with their names alongside one another and grew out from there with other requested adjacencies and units falling into place to the left and to the right. Another example of the way whole sections of the memorial were arranged around a single request from a family member can be found on the North Pool, where the World Trade Center section begins with the 293 names of the employees of Marsh and McLennan, immediately following the names of those aboard Flight 11. Among the passengers was Richard Barry Ross. It's absolutely heartbreaking that his oldest daughter, Abigail, lost not only her dad, but also her best friend, Stacy Lee Sanders, who was at her new job at Marsh on the 96th floor of the North Tower when Flight 11, Richard's flight, crashed into it. I had the privilege to see Abby and her family on the 10th anniversary, and all the pain of their loss cannot be erased. I know they took comfort in seeing the names of the people they love so much alongside one another forever. By arranging the names of those who knew each other in their lives next to one another in their deaths, the memorial provides a deeper experience for the people who love them and for all of our visitors. These stories are a few of thousands that connect the names to each other and us to them. And while I certainly know they can be hard to hear, they are also a reminder, an important reminder, that the connections in our lives are what really matter most. And it is through the 9-11 Memorial Museum that we will fulfill a sacred obligation to preserve the history for future generations. And fundamentally, the objectives of the museum are threefold. First, to be the global focal point for telling the story of what happened on 9-11 through first-person accounts, artifacts, and digital documentation. Second, the museum will address how the events happened, including the rise of Al-Qaeda and its formation in Afghanistan in the 1980s, precursor events throughout the 90s, such as the USS coal bombing, the bombings of the US embassies in East Africa, and of course, the 9-11 plot itself. Third, the museum will explore societal questions, like what does this mean for our future? How do we balance security, national security with civil liberties? And as we get closer to opening in the spring of 2014, it's been very exciting and deeply moving to see the museum actually take shape. In addition to our mission to educate not about 9-11 as a historical event, it is just as critical to preserve the memory of those who were killed. And while the arrangement of names on the memorial is layered with meaning, it is the memorial exhibition in the museum that will reveal the people and the stories behind those names that are etched in bronze. In memoriam will honor the 2,983 people killed. It will honor the individuals they were rather than the deaths that they died. This will be done through a wall of faces and names that extends around the room, rising from floor to ceiling, reflecting the magnitude of loss. And within an inner chamber will be a digital portrait and biography, as well as recorded remembrances that will express the individuality of each person killed. Cantor Fitzgerald occupied the 101st to the 105th floors of the North Tower. 
Many of the Cantor employees were beyond being colleagues. They were family and friends. Howard Lutnick, the chairman of Cantor, who serves on our board, put it like this, quote, we had a rule at the firm that we should hire our friends, that life's too short. We wanted to work with people we liked, he said. And that rule not only applied to me, where I hired my best friend and my brother, but it also applied to the guys who were the security guards who worked with their brother and their brother-in-law. We lost them all that day, unthinkable. The museum has been entrusted with so many powerful stories and the artifacts housed here will certainly help tell them. Many know the story of passenger Todd Beamer who left behind his pregnant wife Lisa and was famously heard rallying the other passengers on flight 93 with the words, let's roll. One way Todd's father, David Beamer, who also serves on our board, has chosen to honor his son's memory is through an artifact he and Lisa donated to the museum. I'm gonna just play a short video about that. I was on a lot of folks. Uh, didn't realize what had happened until that afternoon. Had no idea that our son Todd was on an airplane. I thought it was an alien. You know, we kind of define our history now, don't we, as pre-9-11 and post-9-11. Well, here are some, here are some bits of a wristwatch. And its function is supposed to be to tell time. And it was a good watch that did its job very well. Uh, but it doesn't tell what time it is anymore. Um, but what it does tell, is what time it was. Uh, it says it's 11. And so this, uh, this marks the time that the successful counterattack on Flight 93 ended. Todd's watch is one of many artifacts that range from the monumental to the intimate and will be on display for our visitors to learn the stories they tell. These artifacts are now being put into place and every corner of the museum is full of activity. All of our large artifacts are now installed. The artifacts you see in this photograph are in the part of the historical exhibition that explores 9-11's aftermath. One on, the one on the left is the head of a giant grappler used to move some of the 1.8 million tons of debris off the site. On the right is one of the iconic twin tower tridents that were part of the building's facade and on which we'll be projecting first person video footage such as the initial bucket brigades that were part of the immediate recovery. And in the center is the cross at Ground Zero which emerged from the site where fires burned for 99 days in conditions that can only be described as hell on earth. Um, this cross was uh, the area where non-denominational services were held every day and then weekly, um, and it became a beacon of faith, hope, and healing for thousands of recovery workers. Interestingly, we were being sued by the American atheists to uh, have the cross removed. Um, we won the first round, which is good, uh, but they, we just got the notice of appeal last week but we're having excellent pro bono representation from Paul Weiss, so we're pretty, uh, we're pretty confident we'll prevail. And I have to say that of all the controversies we've had, this is probably my favorite one, because even most atheists think the cross should stay in the, uh, in the museum. It's truly an artifact that emerged from the recovery itself. And here you can see an artifact known as the last column, which was the very last piece of steel to be removed from the World Trade Center site during a ceremony in late May of 2002 to mark the end of the historic nine-month recovery period. The column, 37 feet tall, is covered from top to bottom with graffiti of remembrance, notes, messages, mass cards, mementos of tribute that were left by recovery workers and first responders and family members of victims during the cleanup effort. It became a true symbol of determination and dedication and to this day 
remains a physical reminder of one of the most important and lasting legacies of this tragedy, that when the times require, this country can and will come together. And this is why we're building the museum. Of course, we aim to educate about how precious our freedoms are and how fragile they can be, but we also want the museum to stand as a witness to how we are able to take care of each other in times of need with such limitless compassion. I remember after 9-11, there were stories a few months later that said, isn't it a shame that this unity um, that we saw after 9-11 was starting to fray? And I always thought and still believe that that's healthy, that this is a democracy. We're standing in one of the great law schools in the country, and we're supposed to argue and debate and inquire. Um, but what the lesson of 9-11 shows us is when we need to come together, we certainly can. Here you can see a quotation from Virgil that was recently installed in the museum's memorial hall. These words, which were forged from actual steel recovered from the World Trade Center, are so powerful in and of themselves, no day shall erase you from the memory of time. But what really lends them their import is their placement. The wall in which this quote appears separates the public space of the museum from a private repository of unidentified human remains that will be maintained and operated by New York City's medical examiner. A, st a statistic that I still to this day find shocking is that remains were never identified for more than 1,100 victims. That means 1,100 families never got to go through the basic human ritual of laying their dead to rest. These words from Virgil will serve as a reminder of what this museum aims to achieve. It will preserve the memories of those killed for generations to come. As with any such effort of, uh, as with any effort of such enormous significance, the project has presented many, many challenges over the years, whether in designing the memorial or determining the content of the museum. There are two examples of this that I wanted to tell you about. And the first has to do with something the Dean referenced, um, which is the upwards of 50 to 200 people who were forced to jump from the towers themselves. We had such a difficult set of discussions with our board. We have a board of 50, uh, 11 of whom are family members that represent all three attack sites. Um, and the, the question was, is it a topic that's just too sensitive to address in the museum? Eventually we decided, and this came from the family members on our board, that it is such an important part of the story that we needed to, to share it. Uh, but the way that we're gonna do it is not to use moving imagery. We're gonna have digital stills. There'll be certainly content warnings on the outside of this alcove. Um, and even one of the images that we're using is uh, you can see a man and a woman who are standing on the ledge of the North Tower, 100 stories up, 1,000 feet in the air. They're just, you can see they're holding hands before they had to make such a terrible choice, which as hard as it is to know there was that last something of humanity, um, the board felt that this is, even though it was difficult content, it needed to be included. The second example of challenging content was our decision to show the perpetrators um, this one was one that caught us off guard. We assume you don't build a Holocaust museum and not be very clear that the Nazis did it. Um, but then when it was revealed that we were gonna include the images of the 19 hijackers, there was definitely some significant pushback from not only the families, but the august uh, press outlet of the New York Post, which on September 11, 2009, basically, wrote that we didn't know what the hell we were doing. And the first thing I had to do was calm my mom down who wanted to go down and burn their offices to the ground. <laughs> but um, we thought about it, and it's interesting. While it is a valid perspective, you think of a family member who lost a son or a daughter on that day in that very spot and maybe never got any human remains back, the idea that they wouldn't want to see Muhammad Atta's face um, is certainly a valid perspective. Uh, it's not that many an analogs in the United States, there's very few. The Holocaust Museum, of course, here, the one in DC, is not built on the site of the atrocity itself. Um, the closest analogy is Oklahoma City, which is, of course, where the federal building was bombed in 1995. And they, we went to that museum, did the investigation, and they clearly addressed the topic of Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. So we decided to do it as well. The photographs are small. They're clearly presented. Um, they're, come, they're actually from 
the FBI, their, their evidence photos from the Zacharias Musawi trial, uh, but it was another one of these examples where there's perspectives on all sides, there's validity on all sides, and ultimately our chairman, Mayor Mike Bloomberg, um, wanted us to build a institution that was significant educationally and, and addressing content like this is something that we decided to do. But for all the difficult and unthinkable material visitors will encounter, the museum also houses material that is truly inspiring. And I'd like to share with you a short video that will be shown in the museum that captures a truly unique perspective. On September 11th, 2001, astronaut Frank Culbertson was in the International Space Station. He was the only American not on Earth. As we went over Maine, we could see New York City and the smoke from the fires. Our prayers and thoughts go out to all the people there and uh, everywhere else here. I'm looking up and down the East Coast to see if I can see anything else. And um, to the people in Washington. And I hope that the people responsible are caught and brought to justice as soon as possible. But first, our prayers and condolences to all involved. On the day after the attacks, astronaut Culbertson actually learned that the pilot aboard American 77, the plane that was crashed into the Pentagon, was Captain Charles F. Burlingame, known as Chick. They had been classmates at the U.S. Naval Academy 30 years earlier. In honor of his friend, Culbertson, still on the ISS, made this recording, which was first broadcast at the Naval Academy Stadium before the Navy versus Boston College football game. God bless the Naval Academy, God bless our country, and God bless all of those who were affected by that last week. Thank you all very much. If I may, I'd just like to close with a final short video that shows how some of the 10 and a half million visitors have been experiencing the memorial and the different ways in which they have honored those who were killed in the attacks. It's accompanied by a song performed by the Young People's Chorus of New York City.
So I want to, again, thank you for having me here today. It's really, really special to be back at the law school. This is, has so many tremendous memories for me, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. So the, the, the general structure is we have a, a terrific museum director who actually comes from the Holocaust Museum in DC, so she brings a lot of the, the sensibilities from there. Um, we have a, we're a 501c3, and we have a board committee, which is our program committee, which is made up of some of our 9-11 family members, folks like Emily Rafferty, who's the president of the Metropolitan Museum, folks from all different areas. Um, and when we reach material that we think is going to potentially have a controversial aspect to it, we will propose um, a solution to them. The staff structure, though, is we have a, a lot of different advisory groups to get input. We have interfaith groups. Um, we have a, a really strong relationship with the Counterterrorism Center at West Point. Um, David Blight is a historian from Yale that has been tremendous for us all the way throughout. So it's sort of packaging all this information and advice, oftentimes conflicting advice, um, and then making a recommendation to the, to the board committee. And we feel, you know, I think one of the biggest lessons that this organization has learned is that when you seek input from the public or a particular stakeholder group like 9-11 Families, you have to be very clear that just because you're looking for input does not mean that that group should expect that the final result will reflect their will or their opinion. The 9-11 family group is a perfect example of that because with nearly 3,000 victims, you're talking about a base of families of anywhere from 75 to 80,000 plus people, and on any single issue, there is never consensus. So uh, I think there was such good, strong intentions after 9-11 from some of the government agencies about listening and listening to the city, but there was not enough expectation setting, which eventually translated into frustration down the road when people felt that they had given their opinion and why isn't it like what I wanted it to be. So uh, having a board that we can rely on that's diverse as far as their backgrounds and experience and then say, we listened, but this is what we thought was right has been pretty helpful. Thank, thank you for your honoring memorial communication to us the giving and taking of life is a very serious matter, deserving the true simplicity and candor which are the primary virtues of a lawyer that I wish to respect in my question. It is the mentioning of the name of the Dalai Lama by your very good dean in his introdu introductory remarks that inspired my following question. How do you maintain increases in your requests for the defense budget of a nation if this said nation does not have an enemy presenting clear and present danger if the answer is that you invent one. In other words, you manufacture one. Would this very creativity 
a morally intelligent as it may be, deserve a national September 11 memorial and museum reminding us of our challenges, of our complexities, of our opportunities and maybe our opportunism. Gotcha. I think the way I'm gonna answer that question is to say that one of the challenges of the museum is to create a space within the institution itself that allows for the continuing dialogue for some of the very large societal questions, one of which you raised. Others, like I mentioned, which is the debate now, which couldn't be more relevant um, between national security and civil liberties, stuff like the NS, the issues going surrounding the NSA. Um, and so what we are going to do through video recording booths and moderated lectures and other forms of interaction is to keep the conversation going. And I think that the site itself is the perfect place to focus those very important conversations. Is the museum it's going to be a place uh, or a specific um, room within the museum that is going to show how the attacks were planned or, or perpetrated or is just going to be like focus on the material perpetrated on the lot. So w one of the um, most important parts of the exhibits is the, of the exhibition is this exploration of what led up to the attacks. So we look at Al-Qaeda formation in the 80s, we look at the precursor attacks, and eventually that comes to the 9-11 plot itself. So we have a lot of um, good work that's been done by the team that is, uh, is showing all the planning that went in, showing the, the test flights that the, the perpetrators took. Um, we actually got a very interesting donation from the FBI recently. Um, the, the, one of the masterminds of the 1993 bombing was Ramzi Youssef, who currently is in a supermax facility in Colorado. He planned the 93 bombing, the truck bombing that killed six people. Um, he escapes the country. He goes to the Philippines where he is talking to his uncle, who is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who is obviously the mastermind of the 9-11 attack. And they were planning another attack called the Bojinka plot, which was to detonate bombs on simultaneously on 10 international airliners. Um, there was a fire in, in uh, Youssef's apartment which brought the authorities. He was arrested, now he's in Colorado. Um, but the FBI gave us a laptop that was recovered from this apartment in the Philippines um, that has all the planning for the Bojinka plot, which is a good artifact to help express the story and the connections of what led up to 9-11 itself. Um, and we certainly will do a very detailed history of the plot. The, um, we're going to open with the permanent exhibit, uh, but there is a pr relatively large space that is for temporary exhibitions, and there's so much material that um, we have that we will want to rotate through the temporary part, as well as new things that come up. I mean, I, I remember um, on May 1st, 2011, I got a call from one of our contacts that work at the White House, and they said, you should turn on your television, and that's when President Obama announced that Osama bin Laden had been killed. And I made a few calls to family members just to make sure that they knew. But this next call I made was up to our museum director and that said, you know, the story has just changed in a very, very significant way. And we had been very deep into fabrication. So we want to have an ability and a space to make sure that we can keep, um, as things unfold and 9-11 continues to resonate, that the facility can deal with that. Excellent question. <laughs> um, we will be open in the spring of 2014, so we're in the last six months or so. And obviously there's some flex there because it's three months long. But I, I would bet that we will be, I mean, very, very uh, confident that May of next year. <coughs> Yeah. 
You know, it's, it's, it came down to taking as honest and objective a look as possible. Um, and we feel like photographic, you know, it's, there's enough wacky conspiracy theorists around that surround not only this story, but to a tremendous degree, but many historical events that we do feel an obligation to be as historically accurate as possible. And I think photographs we chose because that is another sort of leg of support um, in documenting who committed the attacks. Um, but it's, uh, we, we face this issue, we have audio from Flight 93 where you hear not only some of the um, passengers talking, we have a lot of the cockpit communication with, from the, with, of the hijackers themselves. There was a period on that flight where they basically left the line open. And it's pretty, you know, it's to hear the voice of, the act of these actual hijackers and constantly, you know, in saying what they're saying, it's, it was difficult. But ultimately, on almost every issue we've sided with, if we need to just tell it like it was. So that's, uh, you know, we'll see how the public embraces it. But I think uh, we feel strongly that that's our safest route. Can you talk about uh, safety and security? Um, will the museum continue and will it continue to be a controlled environment? Or will the, the, the space be open to the public? You can wander in whenever you want. So the, the vision for the memorial, and it was born out of the largest international design competition in history. There's 5,200 entries from 63 different countries. And a young architect, Israeli-American, Michael Arad, who was working for uh, the city government, New York City government at the time, happened to win the competition. Um, and we had a jury of 13 people, including Maya Lin from the Vietnam Veterans Memorial family member and other folks from arts and culture. Um, and the vision for the memorial is to stitch together what was an open wound. And the idea is, in fact, they're introducing new streets. The World Trade Center was a 16-acre super block. Now they've reinstalled a street grid. So the idea is that there'll be free access on and off the memorial. Right now, it's surrounded by construction because our partners at the Port Authority are, are slower than we are. Um, so we have had to control access. Um, but the, the goal is, and we'll have, certainly we work very closely with uh, the NYPD, um, the goal is that the fences will come down um, so it can be freely accessed, part of the neighborhood, um, but the museum itself will always be a, a screened experience. A lot of tums. <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know, I get asked that question, and to be honest with you, it's, uh, it's, it is, it can be difficult. I think that in my position, I've heard maybe more individual 9-11 stories than maybe anybody else. Because, you know, everywhere that I go, whether we're doing fundraising presentations or showing um, the work that we do, people feel, and I appreciate, um, that they want to share their story. So it's, uh, it can be difficult, but ultimately, I have to say that the 10th anniversary itself when for the first time thousands and thousands of family members came onto the site and they found the name of their loved one for the first time. And you know, for some it was a quiet, very somber connection. For others it was treated as a family reunion with laughing and smiling and pictures. I mean, I, ultimately I feel that while it's difficult, it is an absolute privilege of a lifetime to be working on this because we have these millions of people that come many whom are concerned that it's gonna be a sad, somber experience, but the video that we showed at the end, it really is more inspirational than you might otherwise think. So while it's tough to hear some of the emotional stories, there's a lot of, lot of positive behind it as well. Thanks for the question. Um, you've talked about a lot of decisions you made to do it after some time in this issue. What decisions did you make not to go That's an excellent question, too. You know, one of the biggest ones that um, many people, unless you follow really closely, uh, don't know about is that there was the original plan for this memorial was to actually not have the names at street level. The architect, Michael Rod, had designed it where you would descend about 30 feet, and um, the names would be basically at this level, and there'd be a gallery set back, and you'd see the water falling out in front of you and the, and the names right there. 
and the family members really, really got together strongly and just reacted to it because for them, the notion that their, their loved one's names are somehow being put into the ground uh, was something that, that was generated a pretty strong reaction. And ultimately, the architect, as many architects are wont to be, they don't want to give up their designs. Um, but this was something that we decided that we shouldn't go forward with that. And it was absolutely the best, one of the best decisions we've ever made because not only from a programmatic perspective, having the names out in, this, in the, being amongst these trees, it's a very beautiful setting, but operationally, I couldn't even fathom how that would work. We've had, we'll have five and a quarter million people here, and if you had to have it as that much of a sort of ex uh, planned experience versus a memorial park where you can go however you want to go, it would have been a, it would have been a problem. So I'm glad we didn't do that. Go. Um, uh, this is really just phenomenal. Let me, let me say. Um, for those of you who haven't uh, um, seen this memorial before, I, I really, I can't in any stronger terms recommend uh, going to see it. It's, it's simply exceptional. And uh, the vision that's been created here and the connections that happen is going to be something that you all should experience. I should also say, what you haven't quite been able uh, to see, Joe hasn't talked about directly, but I think you can pick up from everything he said, the amount complexity of this project, not only in terms of politically, legally, operationally, is um, almost unimaginable. And certainly, um, you, I'm sure you took a lot of great classes at Penn Law School, and I suspect you didn't think how to build a, a, an international memorial. It was filled up. <laughs> uh, but um, I talked in the beginning about Anyway, as I started out, uh, you made us 